Hey everybody, Rob Mauer here. Welcome back to Tesla Daily. Today we've got a lot to go through, including a variety of reactions from Tesla competitors to Tesla's recent price cuts. We've also got some new research on Tesla customer retention, a new discount added by Tesla, and quite a few other items as well. Quick look at the stock Tesla today after a very strong close to earnings week last week, finished down 6.3% to close at $166.66, while the Nasdaq was down 2% on the day. Tesla did receive an upgraded analyst rating today from hold to buy by Berenberg, although they did lower their price target to $200 per share. Looking ahead to the rest of the week, this should be another interesting one as we have the first FOMC meeting of the year on Wednesday. Remember that release happens two hours before market close, and then 30 minutes after that, we do have the FOMC press conference, which will probably, again, be the most important part as that will likely contain the biggest clues for how the Fed is seeing things going forward. Of course, for this meeting, almost everybody is expecting a 25 basis point increase to interest rates. The CME Group FedWatch tool puts that expectation at 98%. Also worth noting that with the new year, there is some cycling of committee members that receive a vote. So 8 out of 12 voting members remain the same. Then we've got James Bullard, Susan Collins, Esther George, and Loretta Mester cycling out of that voting role. Obviously, all members still have input, and because it is just one-third of the committee, probably doesn't change things all that much, but it'll be interesting to keep an eye on. As we wrap up January then, I always like to start keeping an eye out for CPI and PPI reports, but those don't actually come out for a couple of weeks. It'll actually be the week after next that those are released. All right, let's get into some Tesla news. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the competitor reactions to Tesla's price cuts here in a little bit. But first, let's start off with a report today from Tesla Roddy regarding a new discount on some Tesla vehicles in the United States. Now there are plenty of contingencies on this. This is a $3,000 discount or three years of free supercharging, but it is only with the trade-in of a Tesla vehicle. And Tesla Roddy also reports that Tesla has confirmed to them that the Model 3 and the Model Y are not eligible. So only for the Model S and X, only with the trade-in. And of course, Tesla controls what that trade-in offer is and what they expect the margin on that trade-in to eventually be when they then resell that used vehicle. So there could be a little bit of gamesmanship from Tesla in there. We don't tend to see that type of stuff from Tesla too often. They could, for example, just reduce their trade-in offers by $3,000 and then it all nets out the same. But ultimately, that buyer still has to accept that trade-in offer versus selling somewhere else. So there is a bit of a spectrum on how effective this is, and it also allows Tesla a little bit of individualized control. They could make it a great deal for one individual by offering a really strong trade-in offer, then perhaps not such a good deal for someone else if Tesla comes in with a lower offer. If nothing else, it plants a seed for current owners to say, hey, maybe I should check out the refreshed Model S and X and consider trading in. At the end of the day, I do think it's a relatively minor demand lever, but it is still a demand lever that was pulled nonetheless. And looking at Tesla's inventory, as we have been doing, I don't think it's all that surprising. Total new inventory for Tesla in the United States has seemed to relatively stabilize, but for the Model X, that has continued and continued to increase and increase pretty rapidly. So I wouldn't be too surprised if we see further action on the X, whether that comes through a price reduction, although you probably don't want to do that too quickly after this first one. So maybe we see some discounting like we're seeing here, some other incentives, or maybe Tesla shifts production a little bit from X more to S, or just kind of throttles X back a little bit. We'll see. Obviously don't want to react too much to the inventory numbers, but as I said, this does appear to be a bit of a demand lever that Tesla has pulled. And like we talked about with China back in Q4, when you see two of those back to back, that's really not a very good sign. Obviously, with this being on the S and the X, though, the relative importance is much less than 3 and Y. Speaking of Tesla customers trading in for new vehicles, we've got some new research published by S&P Global on customer retention in the automotive industry. From what I can tell, this does seem to be United States data. They don't specify that, but that's what it seems like. And basically what S&P is looking at here is customers that are what they call one and done. So buying a brand once and then returning to market and buying a different brand. They look at that same concept in a couple of different ways, and they plot it on a dot chart. On the y-axis, they put the percent of customers that are new to the brand. And then on the x-axis, they plot the one and done rate. So the percentage of customers that purchase a vehicle from one brand and then return to the market and buy a different vehicle brand the next time around. So obviously with Tesla's rate of growth, they've got a lot of new customers, just kind of has to be that way statistically. But probably the most interesting part of this is the retention. So they say Tesla's one and done rate is just 39% compared to the industry average of 58% and significantly lower than second place Ford at 50%. 
We've talked a lot about Tesla's leading customer satisfaction scores. This is another data point in support of that lead. And the data might actually even be a little bit stronger than it first appears. S&P notes that playing in different segments improves the consumer propensity to stay with the same brand as they move around segments. They're more easily able to meet their needs within that same brand. For example, you may get a one and done customer for a brand that doesn't offer a pickup truck if that buyer needs to move into that segment. So for Tesla to keep that rate low despite having significantly fewer offerings is pretty impressive. Now this might be a positive reflection on Tesla's brand. I would note though that it looks like this data was data through July 2022. So a lot of the brand favorability question marks have arisen after that point. So this data set doesn't really tell us too much about that. One final interesting note on this data, S&P notes that this is the highest rate of nomads or one and done rates that they have seen in the last 10 years at 58% industry wide which I think speaks to the disruption and the volatility that we're seeing in the automotive industry right now. All right, a couple other quick Tesla updates. A nice one here on the Tesla Semi from Average Jeff on Twitter. They were able to spot at the Frito-Lay facility in Modesto 12 Tesla Semis. That's the highest that we've seen so far. Kind of have to puzzle piece them together from these different photos, but it does look to me like there are 12 there. So cool to see and nice to have some photographic evidence of a higher count. Next, there was a report this weekend that received a lot of attention for a Tesla vehicle supposedly spontaneously combusting on a freeway in Sacramento. Thankfully, no injuries. And obviously, as is typical with these reports, we don't have a lot of details. So really, I don't know that there's much to talk about here until there is more information. Oftentimes, in cases like this, something happened previously where there was some damage to the pack, whether that's puncture or something else. I'm sure most people are aware of this, but for some of our newer listeners, Tesla does publish in their vehicle safety report the frequency of fires in Tesla vehicles. There is one fire for every 210 million vehicle miles traveled, compared to the U.S. average of one vehicle fire for every 19 million vehicle miles traveled. That number reported by Tesla does include vehicle fires that are caused by structures, arson, other things unrelated to the vehicle as well. Next, a couple of quick updates on China. Shanghai has announced that they will be extending a 10,000 RMB or roughly $1,500 EV credit for consumers who either scrap or transfer their Shanghai registered vehicles by June 30th of this year in correspondence with that EV purchase. So again, this is Shanghai only. This had been introduced in May of 2022, expired in December 2022, now is being reinstituted effective February 1st. As for Giga Shanghai, looks like Tesla is resuming production after their Chinese New Year break, as expected, based on the latest video from Wuwa. All right, let's move on to the reactions to Tesla's price cuts in the auto industry. Of course, previously we talked about Kia and GM's reactions, basically saying, well, business as usual. We've now got reactions from Ford and Volkswagen. So we'll start off with Ford on the Mustang Mach-E. Ford has significantly cut prices at least for some vehicle trims, by as much as $5,900 on the top of the line Mustang Mach-E. The opening price point vehicles receiving less significant cuts, only $900 off of the base model. Now Ford is kind of in the same situation that Tesla was regarding the EV credit, where they've got that $55,000 cap on the Mustang Mach-E like we do on the five seat Model Y. But what's pretty interesting in this case is that Ford's price cuts still leave all of their extended range pack vehicles so anything that pushes the range for the Mach-E above 300 miles still leaves all those vehicles above the $55,000 cap. And it's actually kind of right above the cap too. So it seems like Ford just doesn't want those vehicles to be below the cap and drive their sales up. There could be a number of reasons for that. Maybe the margins on those vehicles are just too thin to get them below that cap. That could be driven by a battery price. That seems unlikely. I think they've got 20 extra kilowatt hours in those extended range packs, but they're charging $7,000 for that option. That's $350 per kilowatt hour, so adding that option should be margin accretive to Ford. It would seem like they could lower that just a bit further, get below the cap, and then end up with a better margin mix, so it's interesting. Maybe it's just a battery supply thing where they're trying to sell more vehicles with smaller packs. As a part of this announcement, Ford did say that they are increasing Mustang Mach-E production. Their chief customer officer said that they are planning to go from $78,000 per year to $130,000 per year in North America and Europe. So just like Tesla attributed that to lower prices, Ford has as well. And as for how this impacts profitability, their chief customer officer did say that, quote, we want to make money and we will be doing that. In the next couple of months, we will be reporting our results as Model E, so it'll be out there for the world to see it. Believe you me, I know that we need to be trying to get more profitable because we will be publicly accountable for that number, end quote. So we've talked about that before. 
looking forward to seeing how this looks for Ford. Kind of a side note here, but I had to laugh a bit at a comment from the CCO. He said, we are re-engineering the vehicle on a perpetual basis to try and get costs down. It's a very different way of doing business than we've historically done it, where we've developed the hardware platform and then largely leave it intact. I know it's not 100% this way, but it just kind of reads as, yeah, in the past we just kind of stopped working on it and you know, went on to the next thing. But now we are actually trying to make improvements, so we got that going for us. So anyway, interesting to see the reaction here from Ford and interesting to see how they've chosen to price things right around that cap on the credit. Those opening price point vehicles are still a decent amount below the Model Y, but those higher trim vehicles now coming in for the most part above the Model Y, above the cap, it's going to be difficult for Ford to sell those vehicles, I think. Now, on the other hand, we've got a reaction from Volkswagen, and they seem to be trying to hold steady here. The CEO, Oliver Bloom, saying that, quote, The goal is not size at all costs. My ambitions are about meaning and added value about profitable growth. We have a clear pricing strategy and rely on reliability. We trust in the strength of our products and our brands, end quote, noting that if you constantly are changing prices up and down, you lose credibility. There is fear that a downward spiral can be the result of prices once you start with those cuts. So yeah, profitable growth, that sounds great. But what happens if you're not actually seeing the growth part of that? And that's kind of where things are so interesting right now. We can see automakers make a realistic decision to sacrifice that profit in favor of growth and kind of price vehicles like we heard from Grace Tao of Tesla China based on the cost structure in the future at a higher production rate. If you're sitting there as a company and you're not following that pricing strategy, while a number of your competitors are, how do you ever grow to get to that point where you can be competitive yourself? I think if you have confidence in your business and your product and the cost structure that you can achieve at a certain point, then you go ahead and you make the price reduction and you grow to that point. If you don't have confidence in that, well, cutting prices, that can kill your company. So I think that's part of what we're seeing play out here with the different reactions from different competitors. Ford, the last couple of years, has been seeming to make more of the right moves. GM, Volkswagen, I can't really say the same for them. And we could be in the midst of seeing those tides continue to change a little bit based on the spectrum of reactions that we have seen to these price cuts. Volkswagen continues to be particularly interesting, especially with the CEO changeover. And I had to kind of chuckle at a part of this article as well. They say that, quote, in contrast to Dees, the VW boss likes to present himself internally as an anti-visionary, reports a manager, end quote. All right. Not sure that I would choose leadership coining themselves as anti-visionary in the face of the largest automotive disruption in the last hundred years, but <laughs> okay. If that's what's going on at Volkswagen, it kind of speaks to how impactful the, the culture shock that Deese tried to implement has been. And it pretty much seemed like Deese's sole focus was to shift Volkswagen to be more like Tesla. That was so uncomfortable for them that they now have a CEO walking around openly claiming to be anti-visionary. Of course, that is just according to this one report, so, you know, I guess take it with a grain of salt, but something that should be shocking actually seems pretty believable. All right, last couple of things here. First, an update from Mercedes. They have put out a press release saying that they are the first automaker that is going to have a level three system delivered to customers in the United States, saying that Nevada has confirmed compliance with their drive pilot system and state regulations. Now, this may be somewhat premature as they say that this will only be on the 2024 Mercedes-Benz S-Class and EQS, the first of which will be delivered in the second half of this year. So technically still some time where someone could beat them to that milestone. But based on what Mercedes is actually announcing here, the milestone a lot smaller than it seems. We've actually talked about this before not too long ago. It's just resurfacing because of the Nevada so-called confirmation of compliance. The Verge reporting that the state's DMV said that, quote, Nevada law allows all automation levels to operate on public streets. Nevada does not issue any permit or license based on an autonomous vehicle's level of automation, end quote. So it kind of sounds to me like Nevada basically just saying, hey, go for it if you want to, just like anybody else can. So we've talked about this before, about regulations being a little bit of a red herring. Obviously, there could be federal intervention, but there are states that do allow autonomous driving right now. So Mercedes basically just saying, hey, we're going to go ahead and do that in Nevada. Now, what they're actually doing here is technically level three, but in an extremely limited way. They say, quote, on suitable freeway sections and where there is high traffic density, Drive Pilot can offer to take over the dynamic driving task up to the speed of 40 miles per hour, end quote. All right, so if you happen to own a 2024 model year Mercedes-Benz S-Class or EQS, extremely expensive vehicles, and you're driving on select freeways in Nevada at less than 40 miles per hour, 
and there's high traffic, congratulations, you can utilize DrivePilot in those scenarios. Why does it need to be high traffic? Well, let's listen to a little clip here of Mercedes discussing the feature. There, there it is. Activating drive pilot. Yep. Could not be oh, activated. Oh, vehicle. because he's too... Got so let me catch up. Close up a little bit because we need that lead so vehicle. So how much distance do we need between the lead vehicle? It's about yeah. 100 meters. Okay, so now activating drive pilot and now it's... And of course, this is a very specific system. situation. You would not account encounter that on a real highway. Yeah. The slope curve. All right, so they talk about a couple things there. First, that lead vehicle needing to be within 100 meters, otherwise the feature can't be used. So that's why they say it has to be used in high traffic. He also talked there about how the sloped curve that they're on on this test track wouldn't be encountered on a highway. Not sure how common or uncommon that might be, but certainly doesn't inspire a lot of confidence that the system couldn't handle something like that, let alone not being able to handle something without a lead car. So in terms of the value add of this from Mercedes right now, relatively small. Of course, they would hope that it grows in use cases from here, but tough to see that becoming very significant very quickly. It would be nice to see something like this from Tesla. I think they're probably a little bit more hesitant as they would probably face a greater risk of regulatory backlash. For better or worse, Tesla is definitely in the spotlight, but it would be nice to not have to pay attention in some specific use cases that Tesla is confident in, and I'm sure those use cases could be much more broad than what Mercedes is offering here. All right, lastly for today, just a quick note on GM. Korean media, the ELEC, is reporting that GM is considering using cylindrical batteries over pouch batteries for its EVs, and they are likely to finalize plans to use cylindrical cells, and that it's highly likely they'll choose 4680 batteries. Just a rumor at this stage, so we won't talk too much about it right now, but it would be kind of interesting to see that after GM made such a big deal about their next generation Altium platform. We've talked about the drawbacks of that from the very beginning. But I suppose if we do see a pivot from GM, somewhat good for them to not fall into the sunk cost fallacy. All right, that is where we'll wrap it up for today. So as always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And we'll see you tomorrow for the Tuesday, January 31st episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.